So again, if you have questions about that. <laughs> she just parachuted in, everybody, yeah. just to teach you one. We should hit, fold out for parachute outside, it was really hard in the wind. Uh, everybody, um, we're gonna get started microphone. Me. This is Amanda, Amanda Blount. And uh, uh, I can't wait to hear this because if, again, if you're not blessed with a whole ton of land, or if you are, but don't wanna use a whole ton of land, how do you accomplish that in a small space? That's just being efficient, and I love being efficient. So without further ado, here's your microphone. Thank, Thank you. you. And I apologize for being like, I, I apologize and thank you for your patience and let's get started. Oh, and real quick, um, if you would like to sign up for a door prize, I have pens and forms. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna just put half them right here and then let everybody pass them around. And if the forms run out, all I need is your name and email address or anything like that, okay? Any type of information you want to share. Um, can everyone see this? Uh, okay, okay, so anyway, that's my information. Welcome, thank you for coming, yay. We're gonna learn lots of stuff about uh, small scale farming. This is important. There is never a perfect time to start. That is a, uh, I want everyone to understand that. Start where you are and use what you have. If you're waiting to get that 100 acres or that 1,000 acres, or you're looking at your neighbor or farmer going, oh, I wish I had that, I wish I had that, you're never gonna start. Literally, I hate, this, I hate to break it to you, but if you don't start now, and if that passion isn't with you right now, it's gonna be hard to start later. Land doesn't get cheaper. I'm gonna skip through the housekeeping note. Y'all know where the bathroom it is. <laughs> for a chance for a door prize, just sign up on the form um, or give me your name and email address or just your name, that's fine. Welcome farmers, it's small scale farming and micro farming for you. What is micro and small scale, what is small scale farming? The USDA, USDA definition is a small family farm, less than 250,000. And wait, so I also found that it's less than 350,000. I bet you a lot of you probably know this better than I do because I found two different answers. My answer to you, I'm giving you a briefing so that you find more information so that you can go and ask more questions of the professional. I am not a professional at the USDA. Don't ever claim to be. So when I give you information, please verify with your USDA or your extension office. Your small scale farm account for 89% of the US farms. A small scale farm refers to a relatively small agricultural operation that focuses on producing crops, livestock, or any other agricultural products. A lot of people do soaps, uh, grapevines, grapevine reeds. It doesn't have to be livestock or a crop. It can be an agricultural product. More than 90% of the farms in the U.S. are classified as small. Again, when you see someone with a large scale farm, that's okay, let them do what they're doing, you do what you do, okay? Because there's room for everybody. Family and small farms are vital to our economy and well-being as a nation. Yeah, I hate, I hate to be just reading this. Um, it protects the natural resources and the environment. Some small, the most small scale farmers work directly with, thank you, with the conservation office. And work with the conservation office, we tend to be more uh, aware of our land, especially if you have a small amount of land, you know that you just can't mess it up because that's all you've got. You've only got your one little parcel of land. It provides a nursery for new enterprises and marketing systems. And here's important too. 
So, for instance, you've got Tennessee State University, y'all got Kentucky State University. Um, what's the one right here in Bowling Green? Is that Kentucky State? Western, Kentucky. Western. Okay. So you have all of these colleges that have professors, agriculture professors, and they need farms to help them experiment with different soybeans, with different corn. Small scale farms are a perfect place to do that because uh, they can they can pay you to have a small plot of land and experiment with their crops. Have you done that? I see you shaking your head. Yes. Uh, yeah, it is, and, um, I work with TSU a lot trying to find farmers to, to and when I, when I say experiment, I don't mean that it's going to be something that's going to ruin your land for later. It's the same thing, it might just be a different breed, maybe something that they've done to help with insects, but they need someone in, in different NRCS areas, so keep that in mind. What is micro farming? A micro farm is tailored to any farm. You can have a micro farm within your large farm or within your small farm. A micro farm refers to an agricultural infrastructure that typically works five acres of land or less and works in urban or rural areas. You don't have to be an urban farmer to have a micro farm. You can be a rural farmer and have part of your larger farm blocked off just for micro farming. Or you might live on five acres and you want that to be your micro farm. Um, I'm working with someone right now who has one eighth of an acre and they are grow they're making money. They're, make they're doing mushrooms in containers and everything. They've already partnered with big sellers for grocery stores. A quick history of small scale and micro farms. This is my favorite part because I'm a historian too. <laughs> the very beginning of farming began on small scale family and village farms. And if you see here on the pictures, you may not be able to see very well. Um, one of the pictures is of a small scale farm in Europe and there's a picture of the Netherlands where all of their farms are behind their houses. Like it's just one big farm behind each house. It's awesome. They love their town. There's not an entire town like this. Most Americans come from ancestors that farmed on small scale or micro farms. Keep in mind, uh, when especially tenant farmers, you had your little area that, that was for your family that you could sell on, and then you might work on another partial of land that the owner uh, hired you to work on. But the families may have only owned a small amount of land that they made their money on. Okay, here's something that I love to show because one of the most important things that I can ask you to do right now is to become a farmer. If you're not a farmer right now, the number one thing America needs for you to do is become a farmer. I don't care if it's a small farm, micro farm. We are in a world of hurt. We're going to get into that. Why small scale and micro farming is important to the future of farming. <clears throat> the older population, the average age of farmer, okay, the average farmer is male, the average age of farmer is 57 and a half, so basically 58. The life expectancy is 77. The population is expected to explode in 10 years. So where are we gonna be in 10 years when all of our farmers are 67, 77, and they don't have people to leave their land to. A lot of farmers, a lot of older farmers have kids that don't want to farm. So the best thing that they can do is divide it up and sell it off. Well, sadly, when you divide it off and sell it off, you've lost that big partial portion of land. But then other people can come in and buy it and do small scale and micro farming. We do not want too many more commercial investors coming in and building up on farmland. We're, we're hurting right now. And if they do, that's fine, because then we're gonna have to go into small and micro sized farming. The younger generations in almost every country are playing catch up with the lack of farming education, high prices of land, and current high interest rates on homes and land. So you've got 
older generation of farmers who are retiring or sadly passing away, they have kids who may not want to farm, but then we have an entire generation of people who do want to farm, but maybe their parents don't have a farm. We need to start bringing these two groups together. So if I leave you with nothing else, we need to find out, we need to find some mentorships. We need to find some ways to put these two groups of people together. <coughs> Micro and small farming can provide early education and farming experience and help bridge that gap for those who do decide to level up to large scale farming. So you've got somebody young and they don't know anything about farming. They don't want to buy 500 acres because um, number one, they can't afford it. Number two, the interest rates are high. And number three, if they mess up too bad for a few years, they're gonna lose it. And they don't wanna take that risk. So one great thing is to encourage young people to get into micro or small scale farming. Let them find out if this is what it, it is for them. Because as you know, it takes five to 10 years to, to absolutely make sure, you know, to know that you wanna be a, a lifetime farmer and to start making profits on everything that you've already bought. Small scale farming is great for pest and disease control because if you have a bunch of small scale farms around, then you're not going to have uh, a big outbreak of diseases. As you know, chickens, they get uh, bird flu, you've got pests. When, when you come in and a, and a small farm is wiped out, your community is still strong because you have a number of small farms throughout. This is a fun fact. Uh, you. Do you know that the banana that you eat today is not the banana that your parents ate because of we did not have crop diversity? Their banana completely got wiped out. So when your grandparents or your parents say the bananas that we have today do not taste like the ones that I had when I was little, they're not joking, as I thought my dad was, and unfortunately he has passed away because I would like to eat that crow and tell him, oh, by the way, <laughs> you were right. He didn't know why he was right. He just knew he was right, that they didn't taste the same. It's a totally different banana. And small scale, and in fact, on banana farms right now, they have, they have very strict barriers on who gets to go into their banana farms and who doesn't because all bananas are clones. Every banana you eat today is a clone. So if one banana farm gets wiped out, they all do if they're too close. Small scale farm is important because you, the local suppliers um, have a lot of small scale and micro farming uh, equipment. Many items you need to get started is free or low cost. Smaller local small business grants and programs, that's important. Grants are available for small scale farming and micro farming too. Please ask about micro farming because the NCRCS has a new program where micro farming is important, whether it be ur urban or rural. Don't forget when you have a micro or small scale farm, you're able to respond to your neighbors and to your community a lot better when there's a natural disaster. For instance, Hawaii. When Hawaii had that big fire, it was the local and small scale farmers who reacted first. And we want our large scale farmers, and if you're out here, we need you because you feed the world. We need small scale farmers to feed our communities like we did during World War II. And that's who fed the communities. During World War II, we had small scale and micro farms that fed the communities. So it's a backup. It's a really, it's, it's, it's like our plan B. Um, small scale and micro farms can make a lot of money, but it's also a backup to when large scale farmers can't get to you. The downsides of small scale farming. Now I am never gonna be the one to tell you that micro and small scale farming is easy or it's not farming or you're gonna be able to take, you know, a, take a break. No, in fact, sometimes small scale and micro farming is harder than larger scale farming because you have less 
of a difference in price and uh, uh, mistakes you can make. So you cannot make a lot of mistakes when you're working with a, a small scale farm. You're gonna be, if you have a hoop house, you're gonna be out there watering, checking temperature, checking humidity. You're gonna be out there every day. So it's not easier, I, and, and you're not gonna get rich overnight. And, I, and anybody on the internet, any of the influencers say, oh yeah, get yourself a hoop house and some plants, you're gonna get rich overnight. Don't believe it. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Downsides, again, farming is a business. I, I, I want everyone to understand that. And see, I teach grant writing too. So farming is a business. You may consider yourself a farmer, but what you really are, you are a business owner who provides agricultural products to the community. What that means is that you can take advantage of any small business classes, any small business grants, anything that a small business can take advantage of, so can you, as long as you fall within the parameters of what they're talking about. So always keep that in mind. You are a business owner first. Your name, your title is farmer, but you are a business owner. Farming can be lonely work, one great thing on a small farm, if you make a community of small farms, you can get together, talk about it, share ideas. Um, that, that was an article that came out recently talking about how micro and small scale farmers ruin the environment. I just wanted to put, I just wanted to include that because it's fool cocky. <laughs> it is misleading because what they did not include was that the mental and physical health, that health that comes into play when you have a micro and small scale farm. And small scale and micro farms, especially in urban areas, actually decrease crime, increase health, and increase mental health. So they did not take any of that into consideration when they wrote that article. Benefits, you are upfront capital cost, mostly individually owned and operated. You can own and operate it by yourself. And a lot, many of the small scale and micro farmers that I talk to are disabled because they're able to handle it in a smaller way and still make money. It's quick start and turnaround. There's room for experimentation and education, mitigation against climate change and major weather events. So if you have a storm come through, your plants are going to be the same as if the storm didn't come through because you're controlling the weather if you have a hoop house or a greenhouse and stuff. It keeps the food economy dollars in your communities. You, better, you beautify the cityscape and the landscape. You increase the community's ability to respond to a crisis and you increase the access to healthy food to food deserts. Now, have you, like, when you hear the word food desert, most people think, oh, it's urban. Food deserts are in urban areas, but did you know that there's a food deserts in rural areas too? Like, there's people that cannot get fresh food, especially if you're elderly, disabled, they have to drive so far just to go to a grocery store to get fresh food. So to have local commodities that, and when you have a farmer's market where people can get fresh food, that is what we need. Almost anyone, even those with disabilities, can run a small scale or micro farm. The reason why you want it, these are some reasons why that they have found out from the blue zones. The blue zones are where people live over 100 years old. When you have a small scale or micro farm, you get more vitamin D, exercise, socialization, hope for the future, you spend time with other people, you're spending time outside, and you're doing exercise that doesn't count as exercise. I know all of you have picked up a bag of chicken feed and gone, I don't need to go to the gym. I got my exercise today. <laughs> I picked up uh, about 10 pallets today. I don't need to go to the gym. You know, so people that have small scale and micro farms are getting these boost, these, uh, boost of exercise that they don't even count as exercise because it's just their daily thing. 
Beyond microgreens, this is important. Uh, you always hear people with small scale and micro farms that you can uh, grow microgreens. You can, yes, and it is profitable, but that's not the only thing you have to grow. All of these, can you see that? That's all right, I'm gonna read. Tomatoes, lettuce, carrots, peppers, cucumbers, spinach, onions, potatoes, zucchini, beans, radishes, and all the rest. <laughs> Chickens, rabbits, goats, sheep, ducks, turkeys, pigs, bees, quail, guinea fowl, uh, tilapia, worms, uh, alpacas, cattle, geese, and, okay, so I'm gonna skip down. There's a new big thing for guinea pigs. Now, I'm not gonna say what people use guinea pigs for, because there's kids in the room. But there's another reason to have kids, to have guinea pigs, is that, you know how you use goats? to eat uh, uh, the weeds and stuff, guinea pigs will eat the weeds and not ruin the land because they much like little sheep. So if you have a crop of guinea pigs, you can rent them out to other micro farmers and other small scale farmers and pin them in just like you would goats or sheep. No joke, it is the cutest thing, you gotta look it up. Look up guinea pig, look up guinea pigs that do, that do weeding. <laughs> So you can actually rent out your guinea pigs. Don't they eat the crops though too? No, what you do is you, like, you know when you bring goats, so people bring goats to other people's fields and they fence them off. They make specialty fencing for guinea pigs where you have a guinea pig, guinea pig uh, livestock. <laughs> it's really cute. But yes, you have an actual, you fence off the area where you want the guinea pigs to eat. And they don't dig like rabbits do. So that works really well too. Now, one great thing about micro farming and small scale farming is that you can do niche uh, crops too. Rice, fish, wine, hemp, solar, truffles. Oh, by the way, solar is a solar farm. You can have yourself a solar farm and companies will pay you to put in a solar farm that I, I was talking to a farmer in Vermont. He used a quarter acre of his land they're paying him to put solar panels on his land to provide solar energy to all of his other neighbor farmers. So they're all working together. And then the pollinator, America the Beautiful, they came in and put pollinators underneath the solar panels so that they're paying him for that one quarter acre of land. Um, you can grow seeds and seedlings for other farmers. You can grow endangered, ethnic, or hard to grow crops for around the world. There are some small scale farmers who do specifically grow ethnic food uh, for people who live here in the, in, in the United States. Um, there's, uh, there's one farmer that I, that I talked to and he specifically grows crops for Middle Eastern and African uh, citizens. You can do truffle, or I already said truffles. Uh, you can do native flowers. Um, you can do hydroponics and aquaponics. That, that's in Memphis right now. There's a, aquaponics and hydroponics are really big. Uh, partner with the USDA, Farming Research and Agriculture Universities to become a, oh, you can become a proof of concept farm. So universities will partner with you, like I was just talking about experimental crops. They need proof of concept so they can get grants to do more of what they're doing. Don't forget agritourism. Um, on your small plot of land, everything on your small plot of land should be making you money. So if one day you don't have crops growing, you need to bring out photographers. You need to bring out educate, uh, people that wanna do art and have them sell classes to do art. Every day, if you are, if you want to make money as a farmer, every single day you wake up, your land needs to be making money for you, especially if you are at a small scale and micro farm. So, you got, you got everything, it's growing, nothing's going on for the moment, keep an eye on everything, bring in some photographers, bring in some artists, bring in the yoga teachers, charge them to put a class on at your farm, of course, make sure you've got the right insurances and stuff for everything. Or I've got a big sign that says, hey, this is an agritourism farm. You get hurt, Tennessee law says I, you can't sue me. So get, I think your agritourism state 
uh, association probably has those signs for Kentucky too. So get one of those, put it up. <laughs> uh, these are byproducts, herbal, dried herbs, handicraft, um, organic fertilizers, flower bouquets, honey and bee products, wool, fiber. Oh yeah, people are into sewing and crocheting and stuff. Do not overlook these hair, and they're called heritage skills. Do not overlook your heritage skills. Put on classes. People want to know this stuff. They're, they're wanting it so bad. Like, seriously, put it on, uh, charge for it. And you can get heritage grants too, by the way. That's a whole different class. But if you put on arts and heritage skills at your farm, there's a way that you can apply for heritage, arts and heritage grants. The future of small scale and micro farming. Imagine, okay, this is my favorite part because I love imagining things. Imagine a world where abandoned buildings are turned into multi floor farms or multi floor experimental farms where you can hire people. Now, this is specifically for urban areas, but it doesn't have to be, it can be rural areas too, where each floor you're hiring the next generation of people to come in and work at each type of farm that's on each level. These abandoned buildings normally attract crime. You put jobs and farms on each level, hydroponic, aquaponic, experimental crops, uh, microgreens, whatever, on each level and hire the people in the area, the crime goes down. And we're training it, then we would train our next generation of farmers. Imagine, this, and this is already being done, people are reutilizing old ships, baby ships, and old cruise ships as farms. What I want to see happen, because cruise ships and navy ships already have a galley and already are able to feed new, uh, large amounts of people, what I'd like to see is the emergency set of ships, like the Mercy ships that, do, that um, take care of medical, where these ships go into disaster relief areas and just pull right up and start feeding people right off the ship. You go on the ship, you get a meal, you go off. Fresh food, just like that. So, could you be a small scale or micro farming? Is it right for you? Uh, I do this disclaimer, this is no joke, I did a podcast a few months ago, and somebody called me out. They're like, oh, you got a number wrong. You, that's an old number. <laughs> so, okay, farming information can change quickly, especially like in election years. And I'm gonna just tell you, every election year, look at the different grants. I don't care, I don't care who you vote for, honestly. I really don't. What I want you to do is to look at each time state senators, um, your, your, the, Excuse me, your federal senators, uh, the president, everything. Every single year that someone gets elected, look at the different types of grants that they're going for. Find out what they stand for and then be ready to swoop those up. <laughs> Even if they're not your party, swoop up that money. Because <laughs> that money is our money. Like we pay taxes for that money. So that's going back to agriculture. I want y'all to bring more money back to your community. I am big on bringing money back to your community because there are billions with a big B of money left on the table every year because people don't apply for it. Thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs>